Welcome to Planet Thesis. You have arrived at SciArc's 2021 Graduate Thesis Symposium. Good morning, or good evening, depending on your location in this planetary system. We are glad that you have tuned in. My name is Halo, and for the next two hours we will travel together through three thesis territories, discovered and developed by this year's thesis class. Welcome to Planet Thesis, uh, the SciArc Graduate Thesis Symposium. Um, I'm John Cooper, co-coordinator of Graduate Thesis at SciArc, and welcome uh, wherever you are this evening uh, in the planet. Planet Thesis comes at the crux of SciArc Thesis, at the hinge between a period of research and a period of speculative design work. This is Thesis has been historically unique, born remote, fully online, demanding new formats to situate and communicate a project to an audience. You all thesis students have had to contend with situations that no thesis students have collectively had to contend with before. You've had to generate not only architectural thesis projects, but new ways of doing thesis altogether, new ways of collaborating, new ways of conversing and working together. So first of all, well done for having come this far under challenging circumstances. As we approach the partial reopening and hybridization of the SciArc world, you now have the opportunity and challenge, a difficult challenge, and another difficult challenge to keep engaging with one another and engaging a new set of conditions. And we all look forward to working together to pioneering uh, this way of doing thesis again and readying ourselves for uh, new ways of thinking and doing architecture collectively. The Planet Thesis Symposium is geared towards helping expand the conversation around the work that you've already done and to further prepare for the next landing stage of your thesis. SciArc is host to 85 graduate thesis students, some operating in pairs, and every student is contending with a global entanglement of issues. Despite the individual particularity of everybody's project and conditions, we've also seen emerge uh, through shared conversations, shared concerns, overlapping uh, project, overlapping ideas and affinities. And in that spirit, we've broadly conceived for the Planet Thesis uh, Symposium a set of three collectivizing territories to help focus and stage uh, discussion, which will nevertheless inevitably be contested and transgressed and reworked in the conversations which follow. Those three territories are first, imaging and fictions, second, cities and territories, and third, ecologies and materialities. And we're pleased to be joined today by three new extra co-conspirators in this project who will help us think and complicate, question, argue, contest, and develop our collective thinking, not only about individual projects or even groups of uh, projects, but about what it means, the central question of what it means to do an architectural thesis now, why it matters, what methodologies we can operationalize, what new forms of collective work and thinking and experimentation we can deploy, who we speak to and how, what languages and media we use, and how all of this constitutes the vantage point that we occupy and from which we operate here and now. So welcome everybody, uh, graduate students, design advisors, cultural agents, and anyone else tuning in. You're watching uh, the launch of our new graduate thesis website. And you'll see from the bottom right hand corner of your interface that there are 106 days, seven hours and 52 minutes to the beginning of thesis finals. So let's get going. Christy. Thank you, John. I am Christy Ballier, a co-coordinator along with John here at SciArc. And the journey to Planet Thesis, as John has indicated, is many years in the making for the students of SciArc. And we are pleased for this symposium to mark your landing. To help us reflect on this landing of, your thesis, of the thesis projects and the launching of the summer, we are happy to be joined tonight by three special guests. These guests, beyond their individual research, 
design work, and contributions to architecture were selected on this occasion because they all coordinate and or play a significant role in thesis at their respective institutions. First, I would like to introduce Sylvia Lavin, a professor of history and theory at architecture at Princeton University School of Architecture. In addition to her significant roles at many institutions, so Sylvia is also a prolific writer and curator. She will be navigating us through the territory of ecologies and materialities. And Cyrus Penaroyo is an assistant professor at the University of Michigan Taubman College of Architecture and Urban Planning. His work examines architecture's entanglement with contemporary media and digital culture. He will contribute and offer observations in the world of cities and territories. And finally, we are joined by Michael Young, an assistant professor at Cooper Union in New York City. He is a partner of Young and IATA. Their design office views the reality of contemporary building as a provocation for architectural form, material, and technology. Because of this, he will take us through the territory of imaging and fiction. So thank you all for joining us on this adventure here and across the world. As we make the final preparations, we would like to acknowledge that the sample work we will see tonight represents only a fraction of the thinking and exploration that is being completed this year by 85 graduate thesis students, 24 design advisors, and four cultural agents. Thank you all for your part in this journey. We will conclude this evening with a 30 minute open discussion that is open to all that are listening. If you would like to ask a question at any point, please add your comments to the YouTube chat and we will include them at the end. If you are watching on the, via the website, you may need to click on the bottom left to go directly to YouTube. We look forward to hearing the thoughts of our guests and of all of you about what it means to do a thesis right now in this planetary system. Okay, let's begin. We will begin by exploring the territory of imaging and fictions. Within this territory, we find alternative projections, acute observations, and speculations on imagined realities. The thesis proposal envisions integrating architectural criteria and expertise to design a white location for fashion production. This space will provide a series of technological and spatial qualities for a fashion brand to develop its products. Architecturally it has to consider all the organization of the spaces and their possible uses and all the technological instruments required for a fully digital media integration. This space would serve as a white canvas suitable for fashion enterprise production. How is an environment thought of as a set of bodies? What creates an environment? What is an identity composed of? Can a body become lost in its own environment?
All right, so it's great to see everybody. Fantastic. Great to be having these conversations on um, into- uh, thesis and the things that I'll say about um, imaging and fiction. And since I'm talking about imaging and fiction, I was going to share my screen, but I actually think I'm not going to now. Uh, this is going to fly pretty fast and uh, in that maybe the words are better to lead into a discussion. So the first thing I want to say about this question of doing a thesis and specifically about the the thing that we'll call in a general way the design thesis. Um, The thesis aspect of this that makes it different than those design studios or projects or workshops that you've worked on before is that somehow you're being asked to engage the discipline. You're being asked to, to, in a way, think about the tools, the techniques, the conventions, the definitions that we uh, believe we share and to challenge them and to posit something that begins to push to redefine, to explore the ways in which this discipline is made. And, and do we believe in it as something that we continually create and we continually create through the discursive arguments that we produce? Um, but this does mean that we're gonna deal with language. All of you are gonna deal with language in one way or another as you present your theses. And this often, uh, is structured around the history of critical theory. And when we structure an argument through critical theory, we're looking for ways in which we're going to unmask or uncover or raise awareness of the ways in which the world is concealing the true forces that are conditioning and influencing and structuring the ways in which reality appears. So the problem there is usually defined by a word like aesthetics. Aesthetics is the bad word, the thing we need to expose, the thing that uh, attempts to seduce us with either something that is um, at one level extra, like style, or uh, a thing that we add to something once it has succeeded in giving us the kind of uh, real import of the architecture, or even worse, uh, nefarious in the ways in which it seeks to seduce us to believe one thing or another. Now, a design thesis is actually asking you to do the critical work through design, meaning that the design work has to actually change the ways in which you think about the things that you're thinking about, the things that you would propose as your argument, your area of research, the ways in which you're structuring a discursive argument. It has to change things in order for it to be a design thesis, which means representation is huge. Representation is one of the key issues that uh, design thesis works through. And being that we are disciplined into the discipline through representation, the ways in which those things are valued, what is valued and what is extra disciplinary, excessive outside of the value system of the discipline becomes an exchange that the thesis most likely investigates. A word like image is one of them. Um, Architecture has spent quite a bit of time saying these images are important and those images are not. These images are disciplinary, those images are outside of a disciplinary, they're for the um, general public or they're for another discipline to deal with. Um, And yet, time and time again, we as architects uh, are exploding and challenging the ways in which we define those those disciplinary values through representation by incorporating imaging, by incorporating ideas, by incorporating arguments that come from outside of what we define as a discipline of architecture. And this means You have to critique aesthetics with aesthetics. Now, that sounds like a problem. Yeah, it is. But guess what? This is how architecture often makes its arguments, is through aesthetic innovations, through aesthetic challenges to the ways in which we assume aesthetics to appear, the ways in which we assume reality to appear. And this is where this question of fiction becomes kind of a crucial term, because the ways in which architecture often makes its arguments is through the proposal of a reality that is not quite here, a near future fiction or a near future reality in a better way to say it, because we're not often engaged in things like fantasy. We're often engaged in ways in which we believe the world to be able to appear, to be plausible to appear, to be possible to appear. And yet it is not the way it is right now. So the fictions that we use as architecture, as architects are often Parafictions are often things that not only train us in the ways in which we should look at the world and doubt the way it is and propose or speculate on the ways in which it could be, but also trains us in the ways in which we have to um, look closely at the ways in 
the world is presented to us. It trains us oddly in belief. And if there's anything that is um, kind of crucial in our uh, mediated reality that we've been through, um, you know, not only just this past year with the pandemic, but that we are constantly in a reality that is modeled after images and the ways in which we can doubt and or trust and or use those images to speculate on another possibility is part of what an architectural thesis that involves imaging and fiction would do. I think that's somewhere near five minutes. Possiblemente, yeah. Yeah, that's great. That's fantastic. Um, it's a good way to, to, to kick us off, Michael. Um, I think now just for, just for the audience, the way this will be organized is we'll now open it up to a five minute conversation across all guests. Um, and, and John and I will also uh, kind of join, join the fun. Um, so I think if uh, Sylvia and uh, Cyrus would like to uh, jump in with us. would be, that would be great. Um, so Michael, I mean, I thank you for that kind of overview of your, of your position as you sort of see one aspect of how, um, how aesthetics have such a strong relationship and connection with uh, the territory that we're looking at right now, imaging and fictions, um, but also is something to be, I think, really sort of interrogated in terms of how it's used, when it's used, and I think one of the questions I might throw out to all of us uh, to begin is that I think that at this moment today, there are a lot of reasons to want to use something like fiction as a way to escape, right? And I think that from your work and even um, I think from a lot of work and thinking of the people on this, on this panel, I think more than ever, how do we think that we can see working with fiction as a means to situate architecture in the real at this moment? Well, uh, you know, as, as always, these terms are super duper loaded. So yes. the real is a super loaded term. And the ways in which architecture engages questions of realism, when I talk about it, I talk about it specifically from the point of view of aesthetics. So I'm not, uh, I don't believe to have any sort of deeper access to reality than, than anybody else. Uh, <laughs> but uh, the ways in which architects often use fiction is to speculate, to um, propose the possibility of uh, the world looking other than we assume it to be, to propose the, the possibility of existing and or behaving and or acting in that world in an alternate manner. And and I do think this is one of its um, sort of most significant contributions. And, and it's uh, a very political contribution, I would, I would add, because it does affect, uh, you know, the, the ways in which things get built, the ways in which material gets used, the ways in which people begin to either see their own possibilities for being there or not being there. Uh, it has everything to do with questions of access. It has all the, the kind of implications about the ways in which is it designed for this group of people or that group of people. And all of that is um, like hugely crucial issues. And so when somebody throws fiction into that, mm -hmm. it's a little bit like saying we're throwing um, you know, into some massively important uh, questions that, that we're all dealing with in the world today, uh, that we're treating it as um, trite. And, mm -hmm. and I don't think that for a second. Uh, I think that there's uh, a deep responsibility for us to use architecture to imagine the ways in which the world uh, can operate in other ways. And are those fictions in the ways that we talk about it in, in literature? I don't think so. I think there is something different about the ways in which architects may um, begin to propose or speculate on things that do not yet exist. And I'd, I'd also say that, that if we want to draw a parallel to literature, um, it's not along the lines of uh, narrative. It's more along the lines of episodic involvement. When we think about specific, detailed, uh, intensely sort of um, defined scenes, as opposed to overarching narratives that have uh, some predetermined structure. So there is often, I think, a slip that can happen when we talk about fiction as if there's 
a story that we want people to read and or see in the designs that we produce. And I think that can be a problem. I think it's much okay. more interesting to propose uh, things that try to intervene and or uh, involve themselves in the sort of background of the world in which we exist and operate within and alter it, shift it, uh, disturb it for a second, for a moment, for a scene. Like, I like that thinking of thinking of the, the thing that you're inserting yourself in is you're inserting the project in sort of this into the scene of the real into a yes. into a particular into a particular moment. Um, maybe to open it up, um, Cyrus and and um, Sylvia, um, are, do you have any any thoughts on? I mean, again, a broad a broad territory, but I know Cyrus in terms of uh, your work with Extents, um, and I'm sure the work that you're seeing um, that you're seeing at Michigan. Um, how, how does that spectrum between sort of imaging and fictions um, seem productive or is, is maybe not a territory that's um, as, as explored at the moment? Yeah, I mean, I think that, um, I mean, both of these terms are, um, are really interesting to me personally in my own work and, and in, the, in the studios that I teach. And I think, the, you know, I, I really appreciate the way that Michael set up um, or, you know, set up his um understandings of those terms. I, I think the, one of the questions that comes to mind for me is, you know, who's like fictional to who, you know, cause I think we're living in a moment now where it's possible for multiple realities to exist. And I feel like um, for, for our students here in Michigan, I think, or at least some of the students that I interacted with in my studio, I think, um, you know, my, our, our, I think we spent a lot of time trying to unpack like, you know, who's, who gets to, to make the fiction, <laughs> who who gets to make the uh, who gets to construct the reality, and how does it impact other people? And I feel like in a thesis project, like that's also really important to think about. And it is, um, and I'll talk about this a little bit in my presentation. But I think it is important to to kind of engage um, the discipline, the discipline's core assumptions. But I think um, it's also important to think about who who aren't we engaging, who isn't a part of the conversation, um, who whose stories or fictions um, have not been told yet. <laughs> Um, and is it, is it always necessary to embark or, or is it always necessary to identify, uh, new, new fictions, um, that need to be told, or is it, is there a way to also uncover existing, um, existing, uh, uh, stories that aren't being, um, represented? Um, so that's, I don't know, just a, an initial kind of thought that I had when, uh, Michael was, was talking. Yeah. Uh, Absolutely. And, and, you know, one of the, the kind of key questions too. this is this question about imaging as well, is images uh, have audiences. And, and again, audience often makes it seem like we're now talking about things like entertainment. And that's not, that's not the issue at all. But mm. uh, the ways in which certain images are, are directed and or interpreted and or intended to be interpreted in, in one way or another has everything to do with the ways in which we as architects, at least, um, begin to try to um, broaden our possibilities for, for opening up the stories that we tell. And, uh, and, and I, I think also importantly, challenging the ones that we have told and, and seeing, mm -hmm. seeing other ways in which they can develop. Um, I mean, anyone's free to jump in at any time, but maybe Sylvia, I wouldn't, I'd love to kind of bring you into this conversation. I'm, I'm thinking of, um, I know that you didn't see, uh, Michael got to see this set of students a little bit closer, but they, I know in this group, for example, there are uh, two students and I think many others out there that are sort of working on a thesis by different forms of, um, I don't know, maybe trickery. I don't know if trickery is the right word, but forms of kind of copying or distortion um, ways of using and manipulating images, um, which I think are seem to be quite productive um, for a lot of students. And um, you can kind of jump. I, I thought you might have something to say um, about that. I think that there's a lot of students that are working on that, but you could also jump into this topic in any other way that um, that you'd like. Um. Well, I'm really enjoying listening to what other people <laughs> have to say about it because it's it's um, I, uh, I I I I guess um, 
it, it was very interesting to hear, uh, um, to, to listen to you all as though you were almost a thesaurus where fiction became parafiction, was related to narrative, was related to storytelling. You know, there was a kind of a family of words. Um, and I guess I would be arguing, if, so I, I think the purpose of this conversation, as I understand it, is to be pedagogical for the students, to try to be very clear um, about, about where their words fit into the words that get used around their work and in mm. thesis and so forth today. And I, I, I encourage them to, to listen to uh, CNN, Fox News, BBC, Al Jazeera, just go, go, go find 10 news platforms um, today and listen not just to what they have to say, but how often you will hear similar words being used, you know, post truth, who gets to tell the story, um, what narrative. I mean, you know, the, the number of times that we heard the extreme right this past year talk about the narrative of events, these words that 10 years ago were associated or maybe 15 were associated with a, a very specific um, uh, let's call it um, uh, technic of critical intellection have now become part of the everyday mm -hmm. ideological discourse of the news and its unreality. So uh, I would say I'm I have I have no opinion on fiction or narrative or storytelling or anything like that in this context except to observe how part of the popular political discourse those words are mm -hmm. and how architecture has very often found its own capacity to contribute by pushing against rather than um, sharing in those kinds of vocabularies. So I... So I offer that as an observation mm -hmm. and and um, particularly as we are now um, using these platforms that you, you I thought it was very important to introduce this thesis group as the ones that you haven't met that have been, you know, your, your thesis has begun <laughs> in a new media context. You don't have to invent the problem of representation in media context. It's the it's the world that, you know, that's hitting you in the face today and the 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 advantage and disadvantage and, is that that media platform is shared by all kinds mm -hmm. of discourse producers um uh, and expertise in it is shared by all kinds of discourse producers with whom you might not otherwise feel so compatible so so I offer that as a as an observation rather than which I hope has some pedagogical mm -hmm. implications for the students. But uh, that wi without saying I, I, I believe in fiction or, or I don't. But I think I mean, for me, um, there's a way of building that into the and what kind of encourages me, I think, is that if one sees some of the work that the thesis students are producing, I think there is there is an emergent consciousness about precisely this and an understanding that there's a kind of empowerment to be had in one's ability to intervene in and build in resistances and complexities and awkwardnesses and reroutings of the image making apparatus that has produced this apparently level field. And I think using you know also the format of the broadcast we're kind of absolutely situated within the world of the um the live stream mobile phone link to the um the violent act to the first hand reportage to the posting of media images and so on and so i think in some of the projects, there's this criticality that's building up of being aware of those ways of making images and the power 
so manipulated to establish um, uh, narratives of event and so on. And to me, this seems to be like the power of um, architecture, its potentiality now in this moment in particular, not only these types of imagery, but also um, they're like telematics, the networks and technologies through which they're exchanged and disseminated, that if architectural intelligence can be applied um, to those infrastructures of the image, then that, I think, is where one can really um, uh, cut close to the bone and really en engage with things and something um, can, uh, can be achieved and wrested back from um, uh, uh, the kind of the image machine. And I saw that, Michael, I don't know if you saw that in some of the images, but the kind of, um, what I would say, like the endoscopic point of view that's in some of some of the work of being able to like explore the body with the phone camera, then reroute it through projections that project on bathroom, you know, damp bathroom walls, <laughs> or the identification of the, the fake, the multiple fake white houses that exist um, all across the US. And the, um, the idea of the kind of the white space of uh, fashion production or the volume, the industrial uh, light and magic volume. So th th these, I think, were being picked up already by students. Yeah, uh, no, absolutely. I mean, just in the brief glimpses, the, the brief glimpses were kind of amazing teasers about uh, what's possibly afoot with this group of thesis projects. So be interesting to see where they go. Uh, Christy, I don't know how much time we have. Or where are we at? We have, we have a, a, about a minute. Minute or two. You have about a minute. Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll give just one minute of, of thought on this. You brought up this word distortion and mm -hmm. uh, distortion in relationship to the copy. And, and I think there's something maybe um, maybe interesting for this group of students to think about in the ways in which distortion operated in, in music. Because at one level, uh, initially in, in early recordings of music, distortion was viewed as a bad thing because it caused you to pay attention to the recording technology as opposed to looking or hearing through the recording technology to the content, the reality of what you're supposed mm -hmm. to be listening to, the musician's performance. But at some important points, uh, the distortion ends up becoming something that reveals the technology of the recording. It becomes something that reveals the artifice mm -hmm. And then there's a moment where that in and of itself becomes a goal that has its own aesthetic that begins to be used to create other kinds of music. And, and, if you, and this to me happens you know, in, in several different locations, but my favorite one happens to be Sister Ray uh, by the Velvet Underground. Because that's where you realize that the distortion is not only on the instruments uh, on purpose, but the distortion is the recording booth, meaning that the, the okay. sound can only be understood through that recording as a document of electromagnetic frequencies hitting their limits on uh, magnetic tape. And what you're hearing as an aesthetic goal is that limitation. And so I think when you bring up some of these things, John and, and Christy, and we'll have to look more at the projects in the future, but uh, I think often what becomes interesting are not when people expose the artifice as if to say, aha, I'm now being critical, mm -hmm. but they begin to use the artifice to drive alternate effects. They begin to use the artifice. Uh, I won't even say the word truthfully or, or <laughs> in reality, but um, they begin to use those aspects of it to create the aesthetic effect of another possible world, you know, an imaging of that possible world, which I guess is what fiction does. One of the things it does, for sure. Um, I know that went really fast. The goal is to have these um, kind of intense exchanges uh, for each territory, and then we'll open it up at the end. And so if there's any lingering thoughts about any, any one of them, we can kind of weave them together um, at the end. So if you all will, um, we will go on to the second territory. Fantastic. Now we move into the second territory of cities and territories. Here we will discover a range of investigations from artificially developed environments, political grounds, to thriving infrastructure.
My thesis aims to integrate people of different backgrounds residing in a single physical space using the built form. My initial site of investigation is the Kohinoor Flats social housing in Faisalabad. Here you see a drive through the complex, noting its various features. Changes can include adding bus stops for increased mobility. In addition to improving the courtyard space by adding a roof garden connecting the blocks, outdoor private circulation, or diverting the nearby canal for recreation. I think there's something really beautiful when you look at a thing on a cellular level and break it down into the bits of its DNA and form connections to other things. I chose the Los Angeles River because I felt that it's not only a site rich with opportunity, but that its vastness and size makes it more of a territory than it is a site. It's abandoned and beautiful. From solid to liquid back and forth, it appears and disappears in constant flux. I'm looking at the site conditions as they are within the industrial neighborhoods, the infrastructure, the river itself, and the fauna. My thesis attempts to synthesize research on the aesthetics of darkness, Paul Virilio's bunker archaeology, and the defund the police movement into a new architectural proposal on the LAPD Southeast Police Station site. Initial studies explore the concept of positive darkness with color as an environmental substance, along with formal experiments on archaeological bunkers that are sliced into new formal configurations with porous boundaries and layers of figurality. Uh, to Christy and John for the invitation uh, and to the students and um, faculty advisors for sharing your ongoing research. Um, so I'm going to share screen and uh, introduce the topic of cities and territories. Okay. Um, yeah, so I've been asked to um, really quickly reflect on the theme uh, cities and territories and what it means to work um, on a thesis that confronts urban questions. Um, and as I orient myself to these terms, I think that they're somewhat difficult to define, uh, or the known definitions insufficiently describe the current circumstances of urban life. Uh, for example, city is a term that's often used interchangeably with words like town, village, or metropolis to describe a discrete area with a large, dense, and diverse concentration of people. Cities tend to be places with a material or symbolic circumscription, like a walled or legal perimeter, that determines who belongs in the urban order and who doesn't. And cities often have a monumentality to their fabric due to the presence of large-scale institutions like churches, courthouses, and palaces, landmarks like statues and plazas, or infrastructures like aqueducts, artificial reservoirs, and communications technologies. Synonymous with words like domain, zone, or region, uh, territory can refer to a tract of land surrounding or between cities. Territories are produced, not given, by a governing regime, yet their boundaries can be contested. And territories can be shaped by material conditions like geographies or immaterial forces like policies. Traditionally, cities have relied on their territories for protection uh, and sustenance. Uh, cities and territories in this sense are intimately linked, uh, and one tends to heighten the visibility of the other. A city can become recognizable or intelligible when framed by a territory and vice versa. These terms are critical to discussions about racial injustice, settler colonialism, and political animus, and one doesn't need to look far to see how the built environment impacts these concerns. The violence of settlements, redlining, gentrification, resource extraction, and gerrymandering are just a few examples. On the other hand, the words city and territory have become empty signifiers. If transportation and telecom infrastructures now make it possible for the city to be everywhere and in everything, is it still useful to consider these terms individually and in opposition to one another? The city, territory, town, country, urban, rural binaries presuppose the legible separation of distinct categories of settlement, but the vast transnational networks that dominate our existence continue to perforate the division between these categories. Where do cities end and territories begin? What happens when territories become cities 
where margins become centers. In the 21st century, what isn't urban? Um, I prefer to see urbanism as a context, a uh, complex interplay between the material, cultural, political, ecological, and social factors that constitute life within highly developed built environments. In this sense, urbanism isn't only in cities, though that is its most familiar form. The countryside can be urbanized, and suburbs and exurbs are definitely urbanized spaces. The highway is a kind of urbanism, uh, and my own research examines the urbanity of the internet. Uh, by approaching this extended landscape of, of urbanization as a context, uh, I think we can work relationally and engage the multiple realities that inform spaces and publics alike. Uh, this past year, I taught a thesis studio called uh, 2020 plus 10 at Michigan uh, that examined how media informs our worldviews, sets the tempo of social and political actions, and like architecture, frames collective experience. Um, all of the projects in this section were situated in the year 2030, and many of the students developed works that took on uh, this expansive interpretation of urban urbanism. And so I'll just end by quickly showing um, some of the images from the, from the studio. Um, so Sarah Burton and Josh Myers were two of my students, and they speculated on the future of high-speed internet in rural settings, and in doing so, questioned architecture's relationship to capital, labor, and landscape. Sarah investigated alternative proximities and modes of transience in an increasingly networked world by proposing a web of physical nodes in Michigan's Upper Peninsula, where people, specifically digital nomads, can connect with each other on and off the grid. Josh proposed an alternative model of localized data storage in rural Idaho that promotes indigenous data governance and embraces liminal conditions of, for cultural and ecological exchange. Uh, Sia Saadati and Zach Stewart applied urban conventions to unconventional sites. Sia examined how time differences or time zones and global communication networks could catalyze new understandings of place, program, and privacy. And Zach developed a prototypical video game that extracts and spatializes the content from news articles to create an interactive environment, a public space where users can perceive biased reporting. Um, and I'll just end with a, with a project by Tori Smith, the winner of our program's thesis prize. And to be clear, Tori was not in my studio. Uh, her advisor was um, my colleague, uh, Gina Reichert. Uh, but I wanted to highlight her work because of how she built relationships with community organizations in Detroit and research teams across multiple universities over the course of, um, of the thesis year. Uh, her work explored the connections between systemic oppression, lack of biodiversity, and environmental injustice in Black and Brown communities, uh, which led her to develop a range of collaborative eco-architectural and urban rewilding expressions. Uh, and I appreciate Tori's efforts as a Detroit resident to move beyond the confines of the college and engage her immediate context and experts located elsewhere. Um, I think the thesis experience is as much about interrogating the discipline's core assumptions as it is about challenging or redrawing its limits. It's an opportunity for uh, students to conduct research and create works that address the ever-changing cultural landscape shaping our discipline and to confront issues that matter to them. Uh, it's also a moment to develop intensities and curiosities within academia that can be carried into the profession. Uh, following this, I, I see um, my own reservations about the terms city and territory and their elusive definitions as an exciting context that feels apropos to thesis. Um, how might your work open up other forms or formats for collective life? Um, yeah, maybe I'll just, I'll leave it there. Thanks so much, Cyrus. Thank you um, for sharing the imagery from your own institution and um, seeing the student work. I think there's a lot to say um, about many uh, areas that you've raised. The, the last one I think is one I'd like to just ask about first. Um, I feel like in, in your work, which I've had the pleasure of just kind of encountering, uh, getting to know recently, I really appreciate this emphasis on the materialization of the immaterial, if it can be put like that, you know, the urbanization of the internet, for example. And um, that last project you showed, you said that the, the student kind of went out of the confines of the campus and established like relationships. And I think this idea of a thesis project uh, projected into a social network, materialized in actual relationships is super important. I've certainly noticed that where we've been working all kind of remotely, um, I mean, Thark students are like hugely international. Things difficult, but I've noticed that it has made a kind of new, what I'd say, like uh, I don't know if it's anthropological or ethnographic kind of turn in the way that some students have been able to approach their work, in the sense that their own locality 
there are space in which they're in, but their immediate environs, and sometimes the kind of social networks that populate them have started to become the medium in which they've worked and really productively uh, often. Do you feel that that's something which is, um, I don't know whether that's like new to this time in particular, or that it has a, um, a an especially well like nuanced potentiality at, at this moment? Um, yeah, that's a good question. I, I, I think um, maybe if, you know, I've been teaching thesis, I've been advisor, I've been, I've been an advisor for five years and then a coordinator for the past two. And I will say that I, in the past two years, having this kind of comprehensive understanding of all of the work that's that's um, occurring at our school, I, I have noticed more recently our students like really reaching out to their immediate context or reaching out to other people outside of um, our college. Um, understanding that like we have a we offer a certain kind of knowledge base and a um, a level of expertise, but that you know maybe their interests might be might exist outside of what we have um, to, to offer. Maybe the, there are other people out there that could better serve what they want to work on. And so I think a lot of our students um, are are looking are looking for that, especially in this moment where we're not able on their immediate context. A lot of the students that I noticed were working on projects in their hometowns or wherever they were living, and, um, like places that they were intimately kind of connected with and familiar with. And you know, I think it, it's a way for them to feel connected in a familiar manner um, when we're all kind of disconnected physically um, uh, due to the pandemic. And, and so, I, yeah, I will say like more recently, the students have been doing that um, and um, yeah, have been working, sort of thinking about thesis as a moment to also um, introduce new forms of collaboration um, with, with other people outside of um, the school. Yeah. I wonder, I don't know, Sylvia, Michael, if um, anything similar has been emerging at Princeton or Cooper, or, or whether indeed it just kind of picked up and maybe um, a kind of retrieves uh, a certain disciplinary history, which might have been otherwise slightly submerged or dormant or peripheralized. Um, I, I'm, what was the antecedent? This. I wasn't sure. I think I lost the what what the question was in reference to, but maybe I'll answer a question that you didn't ask or or go to a slightly <laughs> different theme. Um, <laughs> what I feel. You, know, you know, because I I think that there are, um, uh, it's really interesting to to watch the convergence um, uh, of of what used to be uh, quite distinct models for modes of operating in thesis. One was the research model and the other was the professional practice model. The professional practice mm -hmm. model had consultants and specialists and so forth. And the research had um, advisors and other disciplines and so forth. And those two things look a lot alike um, now. Um, I, I And I, John, I, I don't know whether I think that that's um, I'm, I'm thinking about something that you said in the in response to what I said in the previous one that it was a flattening. I, I'm not sure that I think it's flattening. I'm not. I'm not trying to say that the expertise of the profession and the expertise of the discipline or the academy have been flattened into the same thing, um, but they are definitely sharing. Um, goals there there uh, um, and so the thesis in the American United in the in the system of education in the United States is not something that has been there forever and ever it's really when when we say thesis we really talk we really mean something that came to the fore sort of in the 70s and in the 70s it was possible to have very you know, well-known instances of opposition where you had an Eisenman figure and uh, you know, like a professional practitioner or skyscraper guy, and they would be on <laughs> either side of the table and they would defend their turf and oppose it. So, and thesis, as it was understood then, was essential to the undermining of practices, complicity, with development and real estate development. That is essentially what was happening in the 1970s. Um, 
and and I think it's really important to remember that so that we can be critical or at least alert to what the conditions of thesis are today. And they don't look like that. And there are people mm -hmm. who do radical critical development. And there are plenty of people who use thesis as a kind of conventional, I mean, instructors now who use thesis as a way to move through and promote themselves in the architectural academy as though that were its own kind of market. So I, I just think that the terms around which we need to be alert are slightly shifted. And I think that this issue of the, you know, the, the way you were presenting the work that you do with your students seems very sophisticated in the way that it tries to engage the new kinds of overlaps between um, between consulting expertise and, mm -hmm. and research knowledge production. Yeah. yeah. Oh, go ahead, Michael. No, I was just going to add in because this there there something that maybe crosses a whole bunch of streams here, and <laughs> I think one of the things that you're talking about, the Cyrus and, and John, and, and also this. This what I'm going to talk about here in a second ties into what Sylvia was just discussing about the the arguments of thesis in in the 1970s is um, architects doing a thesis that is on the city or on urbanism as opposed to uh, wherever we kind of typically define the practice as a profession as an architect. Um, I find it 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 really requires uh, the student to do a kind of deep dive into a kind of uh, independent research, that, that it, it requires that, because it, it is not typically our wheelhouse uh, professionally to kind of um, deal with urban questions outside of the impacts of, of architectural interventions. And so in a mediated environment, the mediated environment we're living in right now, uh, where things are accessed, cities are accessed, uh, we are all accessed in some remote manner. A student named Austin McKinnis did a thesis last semester at Cooper that was a mind blower because he took Ed Ruscha's Every Building on Sunset Boulevard, realized that Denise uh, Scott Brown and Robert Venturi had used it as a technique to uh, fight against a development project in the 1970s in Philadelphia, and then recreated it through uh, Google Street View as a, a remediated uh, stitched collage um, for the ways in which um, continuity of those problems were, were still uh, um, relevant in terms of redlining and, and uh, racial segregation in Philadelphia. And so it was kind of like a mind blowing project where <laughs> I learned stuff I had no idea about and, and the student was making connections uh, via the technology to a way of seeing the city that hadn't wouldn't have been what uh, he would have done had he been able to go to Philadelphia and the connections of research were pulling back to an artist in Los Angeles uh, documenting the city in a, in a very particular way with influences from an architectural perspective so that was my attempt to cross a whole bunch of different streams but uh, I'm always excited when a student does a thesis project that I learn about things I had no mm -hmm. idea Definitely. I was just going to um, kind of quickly add it, it maybe maybe more as an aside, but please don't do the math here. But if, if Sylvia was setting the, setting the scene in the 70s and we're in 2020, 21, somewhere, somewhere almost in the middle, um, you know, when I was doing thesis, it was, um, you know, we were instructed explicitly not to use our hometown. Like, don't don't do your thesis in a hometown. Don't do it in the in the community where the school is. Um, because the, the thought was that you were going to be, um, like, I don't know, if, you know, distracted, distracted by it or, and, or that it would be too kind of personal and it would be difficult to take that conversation, um, and share it with actually a broader audience. And so it's interesting today, I think, especially as John and I with, with the students have like really encouraged, and I think we're not alone in listening to all of us and, and Sylvia talking about the dictionary. I mean, I think this idea of audience, think who is it, um, you know, who's, the, who, who's a part of the conversation, who's not a part of the conversation, all of those things are now 
Um, in order to think about that audience, we often think about going out into the community where we um, have been educated, where we grew up, or some other place that we have a, a, some type of connection to, some type of city or territory that we have that connection. And I just, I, I throw that out there more as just an observation and maybe just also for the students that are, they're kind of watching, you know, they know this particular moment, but, you know, there's always been these, these moments of, of whether the thesis should kind of go out um, and, um, and, and be participate in a local audience. Um, and if that is prohibitive, or um, I think most people would say today that that's actually the best way to kind of start a conversation for an audience and then expand it from there. But I don't know if others have, have kind of thoughts on that. I hadn't really thought that as much as we're talking about audience and Cyrus, you showed this, the students kind of moving into like local communities and, and we're certainly um, encouraging and supporting students to like, there's a lot to, lot to think about in Los Angeles, right where uh, a lot of us um, are, or at least where we want to be. Um, and, and that is, it is very different, just strikes me as very different than maybe um, how we would have approached it 10 or 15 years ago. Certainly 15 years ago, there was a sense that estrangement was necessary. Not, it was, I think it would have been less about, uh, about um, audience building, but more pedagogically that estrangement was necessary for the student in order to develop a sort of critical distance is, yeah. is, is what I would say. Um, but, um, but I, I um, b before we, uh, blindly encourage all the students to run out of the school and go tramp on the <laughs> local community. Um, you know, I, I just want to say our architecture has an incredibly terrible track record when it has done that. So I'm not at all saying don't, mm -hmm. but I, I, but I am saying tread lightly because that has been enormously problematic and one of the reasons I would be now a little bit more specific, Christy, in, in terms of what was wrong in the 70s or 80s or what we could learn now and so forth was that um, there was, it was rare that the move into the community was considered research, which is to say it was rare that the community was conceived as a storehouse of knowledge that could be learned from, right? And it was much more that the community was conceived, especially one not within the university, but towny, you know, the town gown thing, that that was a world that lacked education, lacked knowledge, and therefore required mm -hmm. architectural expertise to come into it. So again, these are, those were conventions of that period. There's nothing in, in inherent about it. But I think that if you were to look at one of the reasons that students were advised not to do that at that moment was because there was the very beginning, creeping, dawning realization of the violence that had been committed in the name of helping the community. So... So I, um, go forth, prosper, <laughs> multiply, and learn, um, but, but do so with some very, very clear attention to the skill set that you need in order to do that wisely. So going into a community and understanding what kind of knowledge practices are there is generally not a skill set that is taught to architecture students, right? Most architecture students wouldn't even know that there are ethical contracts that you have to sign and be aware of if you are going to talk to a human subject. So the moment you put your phone, your, your tape recorder in front of somebody's face and ask them anything, even how are you today, you are turning them into a kind of test subject and there are rules and protocols about that, that at least in my experience, architecture students are not taught. So go, I really, I mean, I please, please go and learn. Um, but, but it is important to understand that there, is a, there are um, centuries of errors 
that have been made in doing that, and therefore quite a significant and robust wheelhouse of tools um, to help people do them wisely. And you do it without knowing those tools at not your peril, generally still at the peril of the community. So I I'm, I'm, sound like I'm, you know, banging a drum, born. but I'm banging a drum. <laughs> no, I, can I just, can I say something? I just want to, I completely agree with Sylvia. And I think um, in that last project that I showed by Tori, I, I, you know, I think it's important to know that, yeah, like she lives in Detroit. This is a neighborhood she's very familiar with. These are connections that she made like throughout her time living there. And so she kind of turned to them, but then also kind of those led, those connections led to more um, researcher, you know, academic research at other, at other universities. So it, I completely, completely agree. Like, I don't think um, all of you students should like exit SciArc and like completely, you know, um, start to kind of like in, you know, talk to as many people as possible. I think you should think about your role as a designer and, and kind of everyone's role in the conversation and in the process before you decide to kind of embark on, on like, yeah, looking to the community to kind of enrich your own research project. I think for her, she really saw it as a partnership and that's mm -hmm. also continuing now after, after graduating, like she's continuing to do this work in collaboration with this community organization in Southwest Detroit. And so it's like, for her, it really was about, the thesis was really about like laying the, the kind of groundwork to really continue to um, nourish this partnership and not like just like using using right. the community as a as a resource and so that's really important it sounds like sorry i mean at least in that instance I, mean, I think one thing um we talk a lot about in thesis is that you know this is the first you know this is the thesis is something hopefully that you are going to work on for many years to come in different in different ways and so it, it sounds like in some instances the thesis um is being used to kind of build those relationships um that then the, the kind of research continues beyond the day of, of, of presentation. Well, um, I just, if I can just add, I, I just wanna, I wanna celebrate for a moment, the very w wide range of activities that we could now call research, right? So going into your local area was not, you know, it was not considered research. It was, it was considered sentimentality or, you know, it, it had various other, things that it, that it could be called. Um, but is, but the, the idea that there are all kinds of forms of knowledge around um, that can, that can um, uh, make architecture as a field more intelligent is tremendously exciting. Um, and I guess it's a little bit why I was just thinking about academic forms of research on the one hand and professional forms of knowledge production on the other. But one can also be inventive in thinking about where to find knowledge, where to constitute things mm -hmm. as knowledge, how to, how to shape things as, as knowledge, and, and then think about how that knowledge can serve architecture and benefit architecture's a capacity to serve other things. I personally think that the that this um, that the elasticity in um, the uh, um, uh, um, in in in, the, in our capacity to recognize a wide an increasingly wide range of social formations as rooted in not only knowledge production, but knowledge storage, knowledge transmission, and so forth. It's one of the most tremendous parts of being in the world today, mm -hmm. you know, that the, the possibility of knowledge and the things that one could do with it are, are really quite extraordinary. Thanks, we better move on to the third and final territory. Which, which might be might be accurate going into ecologies for where Sophia just left off. Okay. The thesis starts with the speculation on how architecture or the building per se can help in our fight against climate change or how the post-anthropocene aesthetic might look like.
In the face of environmental degradation, we need solutions responsive to dynamic ecosystems. Support eco-social innovation and architectural ingenuity along coastal zones, and understand forms of cohabitation between humans and more than humans to support thriving ecosystems and societies. Envirovore navigates the future of anthropogenic landscapes along coastal zones and responds to man-induced climatic events through the use of infrastructure. This project aims to develop alternative aquacultures in the Isle of Skye, Scotland. The modular nature of the project allows for expansion and use by humans as well as sea life over different stages of its existence. From the Clone Wall City to the Endless House designed by Kessler, there is a discussion of self-contradictory in architectural discussion, which is elastic and rigid, decay and growth, inorganic and organic. From this diagram I made, we need to rethink what is rigid, what is elastic. How to identify rigid and elastic as individual parts and as a whole together? Where is that boundary between decay and growth? What does that boundary mean? Um, so I think I'm the last one in the, in the lineup, uh, so to speak. And um, I'd like to thank Christy and John for having me and Cyrus and Michael for this um, uh, really interesting discussion. Um, I'm going to uh, share my screen in just a moment. But, but before uh, uh, doing so, I, I just wanted to say that um, it was super interesting to look at the student uh, work. Um, I was quite taken by the enormously wide ranging questions um, that as a group um, they were asking, um, uh, you know, I, I, and, and it wasn't enough. I started noodling around on other um, uh, students work as well. So I, I have to admit at a certain point, I didn't know what territory or environment or fiction or where I was. I just was sort of a little bit lost in space. Um, which I hope uh, was part of the goal of this of this uh, setup. Um, but so to see students concerned with, um, you know, everything from climate change to police reform um, was quite was quite um, was quite something. And also to see uh, quite a. a um, quite a wonderful sense of humor that was shared. I, I, I actually, I would say that one of the things that I saw that was shared uh, among more students than anything else was humor. Um, and I, I hope we can come back to humor um, uh, and, and talk a little bit about humor um, as opposed to jokes and irony and other forms of attention getting, um, which uh, which I think uh, I know would interest me a huge amount, in part because I'm really not funny um, uh, at all. 
So I, I guess what I what I wanted to say or wanted to ask or the, the thoughts that I wanted to share was when you are taking on these enormously big and broad questions like police reform or climate change, you know, just h- how do you how do you make them architectural? And I or, or and or how does architecture contribute to those or how do you convert such big issues into questions that architecture can ask, even if it cannot fully answer them. Um, and I guess that's what I think today a thesis is. I, I, I want also to say that I try to be very careful to, to historicize uh, thesis all the time. Um, and I think thesis is an empty, <laughs> piece of pedagogy, and it has been a lot of different things at different times, and it will be a lot of things at different times. Right now, I think what I see in thesis students, uh, 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 I see them struggling to take very big issues and find where architecture can intervene in a productive, uh, in a productive way. So I thought in terms of things that have something to do with climate and resources and materials. And uh, I would show a few little images. Um, uh, Oh, wait, are you, did I hit share screen? I did not, right? Not yet. Uh, Share. uh, Okay, are you seeing our friend Loge? Yep, perfect. Okay, so I thought I would start with this image. uh, maybe just to characterize it as the image that has launched a thousand theses. Um, you know, the, uh, it's probably one of the most commonly seen images in thesis work that has anything to do with ecology and the environment uh, and, and so forth. And so I, w- I would just remind the students um, uh, even though the history of thesis and the history of a certain definition of the discipline of architecture often is traced back to an image such as this one. It, it's maybe useful to remember that the person, uh, first of all, Loger did not draw this. Um, this was somebody else. So the ideas and images were always made by, were very frequently, let's say, made by different people. But Loger is a Jesuit uh, uh, priest um, and, and his work on architecture was seen very much as an outsider. So the conversation that we were just having with Cyrus about research and, and so forth, it took some effort for architects to find this because it really was outside their domain. Um, we think of this as the beginnings of the discipline because of the primitive HUD and the, the transformation of trees into columns and, and so forth. But what, what we do not think about or have not thought about um, in the many hundreds of years since this image was drawn is that we are also looking at something that is very literally about the conversion of uh, 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 living resources into architectural members. And the fact that this wood is a resource that has been turned into architecture, it should also be remembered that this was the moment in which one of the first ecological crises was noted. So this is drawn in the era after the advent of international shipping, uh, uh, so to speak, and and shipping uh, um, and and naval uh, warfare. Um, where wood in Europe was depleted um, and the need to make plantations of trees to grow them in regular lines that you see here. This was about a recuperation of the landscape that had been already uh, compromised, uh, uh, that had already been compromised. So this image that has launched a thousand theses, I propose it to you to say that it should and could launch a thousand more because there are many kinds of knowledge embedded in this image that have not been included in uh, the history of the field. So I'm, I'm interested in encouraging students to think about what they know and think about uh, uh, what other things could be known uh, about them and how we learn about how to make architectural questions out of things that interest us. 
So, of course, in the United States, there's been a lot of interest in Thomas Jefferson um, um, uh, over the last years um, because of the um, untold histories of enslaved people and their role in the production of, uh, of architecture. So there's a return um, to this kind of work in order to try to understand that this is uh, his popular uh, retreat. Um, I, I want to show you this drawing as uh, one, uh, as an important drawing made by Jefferson that doesn't look anything like that house that we were just looking at, but it is in fact, in some ways, the blueprint. It is an octagon. It is the octagon of that house. Um, an octagon, however, related to the land on which the house sits um, that Jefferson inherited along with all of the enslaved uh, people. And you'll notice that the land is marked by these corners, which are trees. Um, it's called poplar forest. All the poplar trees had been torn down. The only trees that were the left were these markers of territory that marked out a kind of octagon. So when Jefferson started to regularize the irregularity of the land, this is what happened, right? So the, um, this extraordinary development of gridded paper and the gridding of the United States, which Jefferson also did at this moment, was really triggered by the growth pattern of trees and their transformation into questions of property. Um, those trees, by the way, are called witness trees. And the question, of course, in relation to the history of enslavement in the United States has a lot to do with who is entitled to stand as witness uh, 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 to what. So when you think about a gridded piece of paper and the question of the legal status of various kinds of living beings, you slowly start to see the way architectural techniques can help you get at some pretty big questions. Um, I'm just gonna walk through two last little examples because these are the things that I think of um, as fun, maybe a little humorous, I'm not sure. Um, another image that was sort of a thesis image that became a thesis image is the image on the left. You all know it from Le Corbusier, um, which he lifted from a French 19th century uh, engineer. Um, and it became the basis of this very famous idea of the um, architectural promenade, which we might think of as one of the first parafictions one, and has been theorized as one of the first films in architecture, so to speak. So all of you who are very interested in filmmaking um, as a mode of thinking about architecture, this is linked to this kind of work. Well, if we were to think uh, of this, not as a metaphor, but as uh, an opening to think about what kinds of promenades, what kind of voyages, what kinds of travels did the guy whose name was Choisy that uh, uh, Le Corbusier wa was dealing with, what kind of travel did he actually do? You would end up looking at and drawing like the one on the right, um, which is part of a trip uh, that Choisy and some of the other French engineers and military people took in order to try to extend French colonial power through the laying of a train line from North Africa uh, to Timbuktu. Uh, in order to make this promenade, uh, or as a byproduct of this promenade was this effort to account for absolutely every conceivable form of thing that could be turned into knowledge along the way. Every crustacean, every particle of sand, every sand formation, every fossil, all of this, uh, uh, let's call it wasteland, became a site of research and knowledge uh, production except of course the sand itself. So the one thing that the French had no ability to do was to measure their location in the desert. This, was, this became a famous um, incidence, just like what we were discussing a moment ago with Cyrus about local knowledge versus uh, imperial knowledge. Uh, the French team was led 
uh, in circles by local inhabitants of the desert. They became disoriented and most of them died of thirst in the middle of the desert, except of course, Mr. Choisy, who knew enough to stay back and send his minions out to do uh, uh, the work. One of the things that is really quite extraordinary, there are many things that are extraordinary about this story, uh, but I call your attention to one last thing, and that is that the history of this story at the time was told in what I would call two different cadences. There was one story that was told in the form of a scholarly scientific account of this trip. And there was another that was told as an adventure story. And the adventure story, of course, had a very different ending than the one of where all the French people die in the desert, um, which is to say that trying to find knowledge about knowledge production is tricky. And not just because you don't know enough, but because the record is itself often written in deliberately duplicitous ways. So more than one story and fabricated stories, uh, uh, to come back to the idea of fabrication, it is difficult to know things, quite difficult uh, to know things. So even though you're not in LA, many of you, hopefully you will come back to LA and maybe you'll go look at the territory of LA and you'll, you'll think about how things what's happening in the area around you at SciArc. You'll think about uh, um, uh, metaphors that, are, uh, uh, that fill architects' discourses today about ecologies and so forth. You'll think about, you'll, maybe you'll go to the Getty, the Acropolis, the thing on the top of the hill, you know, this thing that, this, this, this mountain, right? So that's what's there. So, you know, I, I, I guess my, my last comment to you would be to um, uh, look every uh, metaphor squarely in the mouth and ask what the metaphor is hiding. And in those secrets, I think you will find ways to make things into architectural questions. So what does it mean that the Getty had to be at the top of the hill? Um, you may or may not know that the Getty uh, as an institution considered two different sites. One is the top of the hill where it is located and the other is downtown LA, more or less exactly where SciArc was located. Um, so they made a certain kind of choice. So there is a, an interesting history uh, there. And you know, one of the key um, things about being on this hill is that it's made out of stone that of course comes from a hill. And every effort was made to really call attention uh, to this stone. So of course, in order to get the Getty to look like uh, this, the Bagni di Tivoli has to look like that. Um, and it would be kind of interesting to try to imagine uh, the journey of one stone, uh, stone in the earth, let's say the extraction process to the stone on the top of the hill. And there, are, there would be many ways to do that. And one would actually be through the history of stonework. So I show you here, Michelangelo's unfinished uh, David. Um, Michelangelo, as you know, famously spent half of his life in the quarries, selecting stones, living in the stonework. Um, and it is often said that one of the reasons that this unfinished work was saved was because its potted pitted surface actually revealed Michelangelo's intimate relationship to the stone in the quarry because it was unfinished. So it's, a, it, it's an interesting um, momentary remembrance of the moment in which stone was stone and was not yet sculpture, a kind of duplicity, if you will, that became sculpture, quote, itself in the hands of somebody like Bernini. Um, who not only worked very hard to make sure that stone never looked like stone, he said this all the time, stone had to look, it was like pasta, it had to look like skin, it had to look like other things, but that some of his greatest works are works in which the stone becoming human flesh is then again becoming something else. So it's a kind of reflection on this material uh, transformation. 
So I would encourage uh, thesis students to think about this kind of material uh, transformation, uh, but not in order to just rest there, but to try to understand how that relates uh, uh, to this, um, to not get fooled by the transubstantiations, but to turn them into architectural questions. And I'll conclude uh, with images, um, the capacity of new kinds of image production. So this is the Carrara marble quarries, and so is this. Um, and, you know, to really think about the impact of these uh, uh, of these transubstantiations on the surface of the earth, something that we can now see, not through the abstraction of the Eames's power of 10, but let's say through the power of architectural questions, which really is what thesis work is today for me, is um, something that I would encourage you to think about. I hope that wasn't too much longer than five minutes. I didn't turn on my clock. It was a bit. It was a bit longer, but it was a pretty wonderful, uh, a, a, a pretty wonderful uh, crossover. I would say um, almost of all the territories that we that we've been to, um, you certainly uh, touched quite quite eloquently on ecologies and materialities. Um, but I think also there was moments where I was like, oh wow, this is this is definitely coming full circle all the way back to some of the things that that Michael um, was talking about. And then also, um, you know, Cyrus is um, interested in the, the sort of the city and how you um, sort of objectify things that can't be, can't be seen or, or bring them to the fore of architecture or something like, um, I mean, you, the urbanization of the internet, for example, I, you know, I think is, is a way to sort of look at something where maybe you wouldn't see architecture and pull it out that you kind of take your expertise to do that. So um, I thought it was a, a kind of a wonderful walk through things. I, I was reminded and I, I kind of just want to put it out there for the, the students because I feel like it, the, the architect, the article that you sort of relatively recently, I guess it was a couple of years at this point, but reclaiming plant architecture, I think was a like a really wonderful article, and in a lot of ways, you state kind of in the first um, in the first paragraph or second paragraph about how architecture um, not only has sort of looked to plants, relied on plants, enclosed plants, etc., but that it is in a way a plant itself in the way that it plants itself in a relationship to the ground. I might be um, overly paraphrasing there, but I think it was really beautiful to see like the Carrara marble quarry, for example, or even to think of um, your, you know, the decision to put the Getty um, on the hill or something. And this idea of um, architecture as planting itself into a particular um, relationship. So I don't know if that's, um, I will put that thought or question out there, I, I think then we can open it up to both Michael and Cyrus and we can talk about this territory or, or um, how it crosses over with others. Yeah, I'll respond with two very quick remarks. Um, so of course the Getty is planted um, on a parking structure that goes 18 stories <laughs> down into the ground. So um, in effect, there is no mountain there anymore uh, or it's become a different kind of mountain. Um, mm -hmm. and, and it would be incredibly interesting to understand uh, better and also to understand that that deep cavern um, actually is part of the architecture. So we tend still to, to believe Richard, if you will, um, and cut it at, the, at what looks like the ground plane um, and not understand this, this, uh, um, this uh, deep rooting, for better or for worse, um, uh, that, that, that takes place there. And then just as a very small aside, John knows that it is one of my little um, uh, you know, sort of obsessions. Um, and I think I'm doing it this fall, John. I don't know if you want to play along with that, uh, that, that I have a small fantasy of trying to track um, where all the Carrara marble in the world is in order to do a, <laughs> to try to imagine a sort of a Humpty Dumpty. What does it mean to think of a mountain now being um, everywhere? in museums. I mean, I just, I, I would really like to know what that looks like. I don't know how I would imagine it, 
but I think it would be, um, uh, I, I would be very interested in having that brain uh, creak if I could see it. Maybe we could enlist the entire thesis class to help us uh, find that the, the, the Carrara marble. <laughs> Only if we all get to visit there. Just imagine all the grotesque bathrooms you'd have to go into to measure, you know, the toilets that have been made out of Carrara marble. And, you know, I mean, you'd have to, this would be research. <laughs> and it would be going out into a lot of communities. Also, in terms of the ecology, think of all the, the waste that's been produced out of that mountain. It's insane. We, we, we went there, uh, I guess, last um, uh, fall, not last fall, the fall before 2019 to Carrara. And, and uh, I was also taken by the town that's right next to it, Colonata, which, which is synonymous with the production of lard in Italy. Mm -hmm. The most famous lard in the world comes from Colonata because of the necessity to feed the miners with uh, a transmutated substance that would have the, the protein that would be able to get them through the work that they were doing, but also uh, stay in terms of its, um, uh, uh, it would not rot the way that, that flesh would. Uh, and the thing that's amazing about it is when they make the lard, I know we're getting gross here, but we're talking, we're talking about some, I think, really interesting transmutations, thinking about Bernini, that uh, they made it into slabs because they cast it into marble mm -hmm. to, to cool the lard, to make it into these slabs, to then cut, to then pack, to then take into the quarry so that each miner was taking a slab of transmutated, ecologically transformed animal fat into the mine to be able to, to transform their uh, labor into muscle that would then turn the mountain into waste and uh, also sculpture. And uh, anyways, those are great ways, Sylvia, to think about ecology. Thank you. That is, that is, that, you know, the, uh, there are many reasons to think about ecology, but, but one is precisely um, uh, be, because of those kinds of networks. You know, so the the, mo the moment you, um, uh, I don't know. I mean, you you go you go back to Vitruvius and that kind of thing. Um, you know, the founding of a new city. We can bring everybody together. The founding of a new city, um, uh, you know, begins with the slaughter of an animal and the examination of its intestines. I mean, this is the way you under the the way Vitruvius understood that you checked for the healthfulness of a site. Because if the liver was pink, if the lungs were this, et cetera, that animal, the, the water that that animal ate, the, the, the food that it, et cetera, would be a way to, um, I mean, it's a kind of extraordinary hmm. um, sacrifice. And there are many, many different aspects of it but, uh, um, that I find interesting. But one of the most important is that we forgot it. You know, I mean, it's in the it's in the text that, you know, any first year student would say, oh, Western architecture begins with Vitruvius. And this is in book one of Vitruvius. And yet and yet, you know, I, yeah, fascinating. Did anybody hear? Sorry, I'm just now reassociating. Um, did anybody listen? There was a daily there was a something recently a podcast on the relationship between mortadella and American bologna, um, which <laughs> of course is all about the fat. It's all, it's all about in mortadella, the fat remains visible for various reasons. In fact, related to the ones that you're talking about, as opposed to bologna that not only has higher salt content, but is uh, emulsified um, uh, because uh, uh, apparently Americans don't like to see fat. They like to eat it, mm -hmm. but they don't like to see it. And I think that it, even like pigment is added to the bologna in a way to sort of help disguise or any chance that you might, that you might see it. I def we definitely are in the territory of ecology and materialities firmly with this discussion, I would say. Mm. Um, I, I, you know, we are, we're nearing the, the, the last word we're in the last like uh, 20 minutes um 
I think at this point, I'd like to open up the conversation to um, any students that would like to put uh, questions or comments or, you know, hear more information about uh, or baloney or, or, other, or other material qualities um, into the chat. Or if there are any faculty advisors that would like to uh, jump on um, into the Zoom in order to uh, ask any questions, um, I feel like Elena might have something to say about the, the conversation uh, about in, in Italy that we're, that we're having. Um, and I see uh, Anna and Yasmin, if, if you have any thoughts or questions, um, we'd love to uh, kind of open it up uh, for the last uh, 20 minutes. Any questions? There is one in the chat that I could start us off with. Um, I have a question. <laughs> okay, all right, I'll save mine from in the chat then. Yep, go ahead. No, um Thank you, Sylvia, for your, I, I love the last, this idea of the, what is the metaphor hiding? I suppose that's the job of the metaphors to hide or to, uh, to conceal some connection to a literal or to literalness. And so I wonder if part of what you're suggesting is that then the architects, the architectural question is somehow in that distance between the literal and the metaphoric. And I, I don't know if that's, you know, I, I just wonder if you could sort of unpack the, that, that sentence a little bit. Um, I'm, I'm, uh, I will, I will give one answer, but then I hope others will, will jump, jump in here also. I, I guess I, I, I would, I want, I, I would again, um, do my best to bracket my answer in a, you that know, distance between the literal and the metaphoric, and I, I don't know if that. We have some weird feedback. Am I the only one yeah, who's? I think that? it's. I think it's off now. Okay, um, uh, so I, I I want to. Um, I, I can only thank. Hi, Mira's kids. You're very <laughs> cute looking there. And hey, Gordon, man, it's really been a long time since I've seen you, but I'm very happy to see you there. Um, uh, 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 metaphor. Okay. So, so uh, my brain at this point can only <laughs> hold like maybe five to 10 years in its, it, it, in at once. So anything that I, uh, what I'm for right now and for right now, I, now I think of as like a five to 10, uh, kind of span. Um, uh, I, I'm very interested in thinking about what we once called discipline as metaphor and that that's one that's another way to define discipline um so we borrowed the, the way we use the word discipline is really Foucault's notion of discipline and it's a very specific understanding of politics and so forth which I which I don't reject at all I'm just saying that that's now 50 60 years old maybe maybe there are other models that we could add to it so, so, uh, so the discipline is really associated with becoming metaphor. This is one of the reasons that I, in my view, this is one of the things that I would see today when I look at Loger, I, I see the history of our effort to describe Loger's conversion of resources into architecture as the becoming metaphor. So what I, what I see students interested in doing when they say they want to deal with police reform is having a problem in making a connection between a field that they are understanding as metaphorical and wanting to have some agency action, some kind of consequence mm -hmm. in the world that that metaphor describes as real. So then you're in a then you're you're kind of lost because because you know you've set up a false opposition um, that is very hard to get out of and so I am just finding for now that it can be pedagogically effective to try to get students to call research the effort to track the techniques deployed to convert what was once an empirical condition into a metaphor. That will not always be the same. The nature of that journey will not always be the same. Um, but, but that is a kind of research that for right now is compelling. I, I find it compelling, but 
but I also find it pedagogically useful for students who are saying things like, I would like to affect climate change and I'm going to use um, a, a, a YouTube video of a yo-yo. I mean, or whatever it is that they're doing. I, I, I don't want to call it a, attention to anybody, um, but, but I feel that I either have to drink the Kool-Aid or kind of pop their bubble in a, in a horrible way. And I don't want to do that. So all I can do is thematize it and say that's an interesting journey between these things. And yeah. I think it's a much better response than mine, which is that architects, you know, this is not a, this is not a game of architectural therapeutics. We're not here to, is that our job? So, but that's yours is a much better answer. Thank you. So much. Welcome um, other faculty that have joined. Um, I will, I'll just uh, ask a question that's in the chat and then I would love it if, if you, I'm sure, hopefully you have a question as you, as you joined. Uh, Carol Klein joined earlier. I think she ducked in Michael during fiction, imaging and fictions. Um, and she asked the question, um, and this is, anyone could answer this. I'm just saying it came up during that conversation. Do fictions always imply subjectivity? Can't fictions ever be impersonal? Michael, you have to take it if no one else wants it. Yeah, I don't know if I can, I don't know if I have an, an answer to that, but uh, other than, um, I guess often when we think about fictions that, that do imply a kind of impersonal or impersonal address, it's the author that has gone to the effort to create that, that mode of address. And, uh, so there is at some level a subjectivity in it. Um, and I guess does, at, at one level, maybe it also ties to this question of uh, the discipline. And, and I like what you're talking about, Sylvia, in terms of the metaphor, because we do often and have often used definitions like Foucault's for uh, a discipline that's almost an anonymous um, collection of tools, techniques, things that we can share and thus, let's say, identify when a problem is, is truly a new problem or an old problem or doing something that uh, we find interesting within disciplinary terms. And that does have a kind of removal of the author, removal of subjectivity to it. Uh, but even, you know, that, that is in and of itself a kind of uh, fiction that we tell ourselves that we we use to kind of uh, create the discourse that we that we live on and that we thrive on that we share day to day, and there is something interesting about what you're saying in terms of the construction of uh, metaphor and the ways in which maybe that that as a device. I mean, but then does it fold back into the Foucault uh, uh, sort of apparatus? Is, does the metaphor become another device or? into a different territory. That's, I guess that would be a question I'm thinking about. I'm thinking just out loud while you're presenting what you shared with us. Um, well, I think, it's a, I think it's a great question. I suppose I, I would, I mean, there, um, uh, I, I would say conventions are a kind of fiction that, yeah. that are impersonal, <laughs> um, yeah. if, especially if we think of the impersonal in a sort of linguistic sense as just simply w w lacking a specified subject um, that I, I, I would, I would say a convention, uh, 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 would, would be that I, I, you know, I, I, I just want to be clear, you know, who am I to say anything about Foucault? I, 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 and, and I was not actually talking about Foucault, by the way, I just want to say Foucault has become a kind of crutch in the field. Sure. Um, uh, and, and the, the way Foucault is used as a crutch is to enable the word discipline to stand in for metaphor. That, that's really what I was trying uh, to say. Um, and I, I think that that's something that, that what was once very useful for all of the reasons, Michael, you were um, saying at the beginning of your presentation when you were talking about the importance of representation and, and so forth, it was, it, it was incredibly useful at that moment. Uh, but, but now I think it's become part of a very defensive posture 
um, uh, uh, that that is keeping at least, um, you know, certain ideas about representation are now the old guard. You know, it, it's. And, and it's the guard that would want to protect architecture from politics, from politics, I, I guess. So that's why I'm saying that I think it's a kind of crutch because Foucault is deeply political in the kinds of uh, impact that he wanted philosophy to have and that it, it did in fact have. Um, so I, um, yeah, anyway. Cyrus. Yeah, so, so Carol, I, I don't, I don't know if we answered your question. I don't know if you're here, <laughs> Carol, but uh, it was a good one. I was thinking. So, thank you. Any, any, um, anyone, any faculty that jumped on like to jump in, or we can. We can continue. I feel like we should open it up. So. Hi, I'm okay, just thank here. you. <laughs> Hi, Sylvia. Hi, Michael. Hi, Cyrus. Thank you so much for joining us. But I think maybe the students have some questions. I just have a quick comment. I'm just here to say hi to Sylvia, who was my thesis advisor 25 years ago. <laughs> and now I'm advising somebody <laughs> in the stream. So hi, Sylvia. <laughs> John, are there any questions um, in the YouTube stream? Not that I can see from the students. Oh. They may be coming on the Zoom. Maybe I, I just wanted to bring up something I think that you, John and Christy, um, put on the table for us in thesis with the idea of making a statement and the statement as something that lives both through artifacts, also through words, but then through the literal utterance of the words. And I know we had a discussion during thesis prep about voice and that kind of act of live like speaking the statement. And so I'd be curious um, to hear what Sylvia and Cyrus and Michael um, think about the role of a, a statement, because we, several of you touched on um, things like what kinds of stories are told, the multiple stories that Sylvia referred to in uh, Schwazi's expedition, um, the fiction, the act of duplicity. So there were, there were several things that seemed to kind of touch on this issue of a statement and how we vocalize it. Um, is, is, are you saying, does thesis have to have a statement? Does it have to be discursive? Is thesis discursive? Is that your question? No, I, I, my question is really about maybe how the role of the statement is evolving and this idea that there might be, you know, we, you talked a bit about knowledge production and it got me thinking about um, Fred Moten and Stefano Harney and the discussion of study as this kind of suspension, this state that doesn't result in a kind of um, fixed thing that we might refer to as knowledge, but it's engaging in this kind of activity. And then I was thinking about the statement and the utterance of the statement as a, a kind of performative that maybe is not an artifact. I, yeah, that's sort of where I was going with it. Yeah, I think maybe it's um, the the idea, and we talked about this a little bit in the right before we went live. Uh, Sylvia, Cyrus, and Michael, the fact that we made a transition this year, a pretty deliberate one, um, with the with the design advisors and cultural agents to not ask the students to do like a a design prep and then a written statement, but that the, like having their voice, having their um, kind of presentation, their verbal presentation as a part of the thing that they were working on and developing and, and sort of having those things together. So that the idea of making a statement instead of you sort of make something and there's a statement sort of adjacent to it. Um, sure. And I don't know if this is, this is not necessarily, um... A direct answer, but I'll say after eight months of online Zoom 
thesis that just ended last week. Uh, the thesis students that, that I was working with, they gave the best thesis presentations I've, I've ever seen. And, and I actually think it was because they had to present their thesis every single week. Because mm -hmm. the only format we had was, was Zoom. We never saw them in person. By the way, I'm not saying they were the best design projects. I'm not saying they were the most provocative arguments. I'm not saying they were the best thesis projects I've ever seen. They were the best thesis presentations. And uh, I think it has something to do with the fact that they had to perform the presentation of their mm -hmm. thesis weekly. And uh, only, only the, the kind of cons the constraints of forcing this, us into this kind of boxes of Zoom would have, would have done that. And, and uh, so I don't ever want to have to do it again that way. <laughs> um, but uh, there, was, there was a kind of uh, strange thing. So by the time we got to the final, those presentations were tuned. And um, I think it does have something to do with the constant refinement of, of the performance of, of a discursive uh, verbal statement alongside with the imagery that they're showing, because essentially that's what we were looking at. We weren't ever really looking at indoor interrogating drawings or models. We were essentially looking at films with spoken word. Uh, and that uh, was an interesting thing that came out of this year. And, and uh, not necessarily um, something we'll repeat, but not necessarily something that, that was um, problematic or, or bad. Uh -huh. in, in many ways, the arguments were, were, were compelling before that. Michael, Michael don't, don't you think, I mean, I feel as though this, this just accelerated um, the becoming film. <laughs> Um, or the becoming video, the becoming social media of architectural conversation that has been happening uh, for years. And Zoom is just the thing that tipped it over and made it, uh, made it ubiquitous. And, um, you know, I, I, after listening to watch, I don't even know what the right verb would be, engaging the, this, this student work in, in, in this way, I... Um, you know, you, you definitely start to feel a kind of overdetermination of the format and questions of simultaneity forwards. I'm sure you guys have all had these these conversations um, that as you go, you know, we have reels and broadcasts and before the speakers speak, there's one, two, three, go. You know, the kind of entire film universe is 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 um, structuring the discourse. And, um, you know, there are going to be a lot of advantages of it, but but. I, I, um, it, I, I, one of this one, when I went off track, I, I became disobedient and started, I, I, I did, I, I faithfully watched every one of the students work that you had me watch and, and was riveted by them all. But then I became a little undisciplined and started moving around. And, and Anya, I, one of your students, I, I realized that the, when I, I, I had a new form of attention with these videos, Mm -hmm. And the first one was to look at the time ticker at the bottom and be reassured, oh, it's two and a half minutes. <laughs> you know, that th this was a kind of amount of time that I could manage. And one of your students was like 10 fucking minutes. And I almost fell off my chair. I was like, how am I going to pay attention for this long? And, and so I was like, OK, uh, I'll, I'll do this. But, but that student in particular was very unslick. So I, I realized it was only when I heard that student that I realized how incredibly rehearsed all the other ones had been. There was a script, they read it perfectly. They had clearly, as you were saying, Michael, read it many times. They, many of them were even speaking, not in their um, uh, native uh, language, so you knew for sure that the lack of split infinitives that had been edited, you know, it was, I, it was, it was really interesting. And I was extremely bothered at first by the, um, the insolence of this student's impromptuness that <laughs> and all the hands and haws and ahs. And it was like, <laughs> they had just cut this out. It would have been seven minutes and I wouldn't have been so enraged at how much time it was taking. But um, but but I but I realized that the that the that in in the end the roughness produced a kind of attention mm -hmm. uh, produced a kind of embattlement 
And I would imagine that the roughness, it, uh, this is a Neymark uh, student. This is somebody who's going to be interested in roughness and rudeness and so forth. So I just, I just call attention to that because for me, that was a moment in which the format was, um, uh, was itself irritated a little bit <laughs> precisely because they wasn't so polished. I mean, I don't know. I may be reading too much into it, but that's what they pay me to do. <laughs> I think that student did follow the rules and submit a three minute one, but she, I think really preferred the 10 minute one. I think she was in your category, uh, Cyrus, uh, Julie, and she's also on this call. Um, I do not, you do not need to ask a question, Julie, but um, I do, a, I did appreciate watching the three minute version versus the 10 minute version. Um, and I think a lot of students probably struggled with how do I in prep while I'm researching, while things are still kind of slow, how do I edit down this much information? Um, and I think that I, I like that Michael and Sylvia, you've brought it up and, and you know, Cyrus, I think probably he had to watch the 10 minute one. Sylvia, you, you just went there. <laughs> yeah. Well, I was going to say the, the 10 minute, you know, I think Julie's um, video uh, was the only one in the set that I was given that where you could see the person presenting, even though it was just her hands. I think the other four, um, just an observation, like, you know, the, the statement is, is read um, and narrated, but you don't ever see the, the presence of the, of the author, um, which I think is just interesting in this kind of Zoom universe and, um, and relative to just in-person um, presentations of thesis work. Like this is a moment where you, the, the kind of absence of the physical, you know, appearance of, of the author is, is really kind of um, noticeable. Um, I guess the other thing I was going to say is that I think with thesis, unlike other studios, it's really, I see it as really a moment where writing is integral to the development of the design work and vice versa, that those things, unlike other studios are really kind of treated like hand in hand, or, or you sort of move between those two in ways that I don't feel like other studios really encourage or make space for. And so I think Marceline, with, with your question, I think the, what I noticed this year, at least with our students, um, was maybe an effort to also just question the structure of the statement. Um, you know, I think I'm the, in the way that I um, think about thesis statements and how they're structured, it, you know, oftentimes there's stakes, there's methods and there's outcomes and those are really clear. But I think a lot of the students that I notice in, in our cohort um, found, I don't, I don't know, took liberties maybe with how they, they um, revealed what those three things were in their projects. And maybe it was more about storytelling or maybe more mm -hmm. about lived experience. And like those things are foregrounded as opposed to kind of, um, yeah, and as opposed to a more straightforward and um, direct kind of, um, uh, yeah, listing of all of those things. Cyrus, don't you find that there's, a, there's, a, um, there, there's something a little bit interestingly jarring, but maybe just jarring, uh, about seeing what are really social media platforms um, overlaid with academic discourse. Um, you know, there, there, there's, there's basically no institution better than the New York Times at making fun of academics and their highfalutin way of talking, except maybe Cyarch students now, because this, this meme thing with uh, discursive jargon, it, it's really, I, I mean, I have to say, um, I don't know, like uh, Jackie, um, uh, I mean, she was not jarring at all. There could be nothing jarring about her teddy sponge soft uh, world. <laughs> um, but, 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 but I, I, I actually wanted to encourage you to encourage her to also think about language as a kind of softness. So if, you know, if you had a caption and you had a fuzzy caption, right? So her universe seemed to me like a universe of memes where the same thing gets radically transformed by just the addition or the elimination of a single word. And the word itself can be just as soft and squishy and elusive in its meaning as the stuff in it. So I, I really, um, um, wanted to see more play with um, uh, with the format, uh, especially if they're going to continue working on the format. But I, I, again, this is where I would I would say 
I don't know. I, I guess I, I had a parent who studied Bernini. So I have Bernini on the brain all the time, you know, who had this Bernini with this famous phrase, you know, if it wasn't true, you had to invent it. So if Zoom was not true, now you have to invent it. You have to make it important. And so what are the discursive modes that are appropriate to social the social media age? How does architecture find new kinds of ideas, not just translate old ones? Uh, uh, yeah, into that. So that was my, I thought she was totally ready. And I imagined also that there could be multiple languages there. I mean, mm -hmm. I know that that you, the school conducts its business in, in English, but I mean, for Christ's sakes, like enough with the English in, in some way, you know, there are many automatic ways to make things go into multiple languages. It's a kind of tyranny of, of English. And, um, you know, I'm just sort of done with that and would, would like to, you know, would, would like to hear it in, in a different way mm -hmm. and, and would like these elasticities to be like, well, if you just translated that and I don't know, I don't remember where she was from or who she was or what she would be saying if she was speaking in a different language. But if that was the way it was presented and then we got the bad translation back into English for for the idiots like me who don't know Korean. I mean, you know, I should get the bad translation. She shouldn't be forced to perform it, which is part of the urbanity of the internet to borrow Cyrus's <laughs> very brilliant term. John, man, I, it's, it's almost as if we paid Sylvia to say that last part, because as part of uh, the research semester, we asked the students to consider forms of translation. Um, and, and I think it's something we haven't yet fully embraced, but I think that, um, the, the idea that things could be told in different ways and in different languages, I think is something that um, I think John's um, brought up many times and, and we sort of embedded it in the syllabus, but it's not, it hasn't yet um, infiltrated um, into the, into a larger way of, of working. So we did not, we did not pay you to say that, but I think we would agree with you. I think John and I have probably had that conversation between us also at various moments in the past, but I'm, you know, I, I am just really tired, so I'm talking a lot. I'm, re I'm really sorry, so I hope well, we're gonna end this pretty soon. Yes. But I, I just, like, do you have internet poets come and talk to the students, for example? I mean, I'm just, I'm just excited on, on Cyark's behalf, uh, I, excited by the fact that its great asset is this incredible deficiency that it's not part of a university system. And therefore, it can invent its what expertise it feels that its students need. And I think that there are a lot of people who've done a lot of sophisticated production around the new forms of language <laughs> and discourse um, uh, that, that moves around this, this world. And I would, I would so uh, um, be entranced by what architecture sounds like in that language, I have absolutely no idea. But I think that sci art thesis can do that in a, in a way that other places can't. Oh, with that, it is getting it is getting late. We thank you for um, for offering your time this evening, especially those of you that are on the East Coast are in. Uh, central time are um, sort of offering uh, additional hours into your evening. Um, and for those of you that are uh, watching around around the world, uh, we'd like to thank you for joining us uh, this evening and for the faculty that have jumped on and hopefully those students and faculty that are watching um, or will watch in the coming days as we do now. Um, we thank you. Um, I'd also like to thank, yeah, I see Elena here. I'd like to thank Elena for her support with this symposium. Um, and also uh, like to thank uh, Lydia Djokovic um, who provided uh, the avatar, which those of you here on Zoom have not gotten to experience, but you can watch it uh, later. So John, I don't know if you wanna have any closing thank yous before we roll the credits. No, let's go roll the credits and okay. to the Amazon.
Okay. Thank you all. Roll the credits. Thank you for being at Sire. Ciao. Thank you. Thank you all for an informative and open discussion. To develop an architecture thesis today requires both individual ambition and a collective understanding of a broader situation. Good luck to the class of 2021. I wish you a summer of robust inquiry and assured creation.